I have decided to make a short course of lectures under the common title uh, How to Break Einstein's Speed Limit. In this course, I collected three simple examples of superluminal motions in nature. Today, we will talk about the first example, which is the superluminal spreading of localized wave packets. Next time, we'll see how the speed limit can be overcome by particles orbiting about a common center of mass. And in the third lecture, we'll talk about neutrino velocity oscillations. Here is the outline of today's lecture. First, I will remind you why special relativity had to introduce its famous ban on faster than light velocities. <clears throat> then we will recall some basic facts from Wigner's relativistic quantum theory of particles. We will see how a localized wave function can spread out faster than the speed of light, thus contradicting special relativity. Then we will discuss boost transformations of wave functions. And finally, I'll try to convince you that superluminal spreading does not create any problems with relativity and causality. To make things as simple as possible, in this lecture, I'll pretend that our world has only one space dimension, which I will call R. Then the Minkowski spacetime is a two-dimensional plane where each event is characterized by two coordinates, c, t, and r. I multiply time t by the speed of light c so that this coordinate has a physical dimension of distance, the same as r. This rescaling of time is convenient, for example, because in our coordinates, the trajectory of a photon emitted from the origin makes the angle of 45 degrees with both R and CT axis. This line is called sometimes a light cone. We know that massive particles move slower than light. Their trajectories are called subluminal as shown by the green arrow here. If a trajectory were superluminal, it would be found on the other side of the light cone, as the blue arrow in this figure shows. These were trajectories seen by a stationary observer at rest. But what would a moving observer see? To answer this question, we have to apply so-called Lorentz transformations. These formulas were invented by Hendrik Lorentz at the end of 19th century, and they became an integral part of Einstein's theory of relativity. For an observer moving with velocity w, the primed coordinates of the event, ct prime and r prime, are linear functions of the coordinates ct and r measured by the observer at rest. It is more convenient to simplify these formulas by introducing the so-called rapidity theta, whose hyperbolic tangent is equal to the ratio w over c. Then the square roots in Lorentz transformations are expressed as hyperbolic cosines and sines of the theta, and the transformations acquire a very compact form. This form looks very similar to coordinate transformations under rotations. So it should be no surprise that in the Minkowski spacetime, Lorentz boost transformations are represented by the so-called pseudo rotation of coordinate axis. In contrast to 
a normal rotation where axes turn in the same direction. The pseudo rotation turns space and time axis in opposite directions as shown in the figure. From the point of view of the observer at rest, the axis CT prime and R prime are no longer orthogonal. But from the point of view of the moving observer himself, his axes are perpendicular to each other. This follows from the principle of relativity. Now, if a particle trajectory was subluminal in the rest frame, then in the moving frame its motion will remain subluminal as well. No surprises here. However, if the rest frame motion was superluminal, then there exists a moving frame where the particle reaches its destination before it was emitted. This is a scandalous violation of the principle of causality, which says that the cause should happen earlier than the effect for all observers. The only way to fix this absurdity in special relativity is to demand that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Thus we arrive to Einstein's universal speed limit. Let me now switch gears and turn to quantum mechanics. This is Wigner's relativistic quantum theory of particles. The main postulate of this theory says that particles Hilbert space must carry an irreducible unitary representation of the Poincaré group. We have discussed this theory in full details in two previous lectures. Here we are going to apply this approach to see how free particles propagate in space from the point of view of different observers. In our one-dimensional space, the Poincaré group is three-dimensional. Its Lie algebra is also three-dimensional. As usual, the generators of the Lie algebra representation are Hermitian operators that correspond to real physical observables. The generator of space translations P is the operator of the total momentum of the system. The generator of time translations H is the Hamiltonian and the generator of boosts K is an observable whose physical meaning is the product of the center of mass position and total energy. These operators satisfy well-known commutation relations. Remarkably, other physical observables can be expressed as functions of the three generators introduced above. Here is the operator of mass. Uh, note that elementary particles are described by irreducible representations where the mass operator acts as multiplication by a single non-negative number, small m. Then the Hamiltonian becomes a simple function of momentum. And relativistic velocity is defined as the ratio of momentum and energy. Finally, we will need the following definition of the position operator, which involves the generator of boost. All these definitions are consistent with each other. For example, let us calculate the time evolution of the position operator in the Heisenberg picture. Quite predictably, we get that the center of mass of our system moves with a constant velocity. 
if our particle is massive, then this velocity is lower than the speed of light. A more precise statement is that the spectrum of the velocity operator is the segment between minus c and c, which does not include the endpoints. The speed of a massless particle, such as a photon, is exactly the speed of light, c. In other words, the spectrum of the velocity operator in this case, consists of two points, minus c and c. All this seems to be in perfect agreement with special relativity. Let us now take a closer look at how particle wave functions change under inertial transformations of the observer. These transformations can be written most conveniently in the momentum representation. For example, a space translation by the distance a multiplies the wave function by the exponential plane wave factor. Time translation multiplies the wave function by a factor where time t is multiplied by the energy function that we will denote by omega of p. Finally, a boost transformation shifts wave function argument and multiplies the function by a normalization factor. One can verify explicitly that the set of above transformations fulfills a unitary representation of the Poincaré group. But for our purposes, it's more important to see how position space wave functions transform. This slide is divided into two parts. On the left hand side, I show wave functions in the momentum representation. And on the right hand side, I show position space wave functions of the same state. Let us begin with a simple Gaussian shaped wave function centered around zero momentum value. We know that transition from the momentum space to the position space is given by the Fourier integral. As a Fourier transform of a Gaussian is another Gaussian, we get the position space wave function which is localized near the origin. Next, we apply space translation. In the momentum space, this amounts to multiplying the function by a plane wave. In the position space, this transformation shifts the function as a whole by the distance a. This is what we would expect from a space translation. Boost transformation looks a bit intimidating, but if we are interested in low boost velocities w, then this transformation is not much different from a shift in the momentum space. This means that particle acquired extra momentum and velocity. The position space wave function is multiplied by a plane wave factor. Next, let's see how time translations are represented. In the case of massless particle, the energy function is simply p times c. So in the momentum space, the wave function is multiplied by a plane wave. This means that position wave function is shifted by the distance of ct. Just as we expected, photons wave packet moves in space with a constant velocity c. Now, what about massive particles? To evaluate the 
time evolution in the position space, we have to calculate the integral on the right. Where the energy function is the well-known square root. Unfortunately, this integral cannot be taken analytically, so we'll have to resort to some approximations. The major components of the integrand are shown in the figure on the left. The initial wave function is shown by a blue line. It is centered at the momentum value P0. The brown line shows the energy function omega of P in this region. If the wave function is well localized in the momentum space, then we can use a linear approximation for the omega of p. Note that the coefficient v0 of this Taylor expansion is nothing but the relativistic velocity of the particle. Then the integral takes the following form. In other words, the time evolution of the wave packet has two parts. First, the argument of the wave function is shifted by the value v0 times t. Second, the function is multiplied by a unimodular factor. This transformation is shown here. But if we are interested in the probability density, which is a square of the modulus of the wave function. Then the unimodular factor disappears and all that happens is the shift of the wave packet as a whole with velocity v0. We can conclude that in the linear approximation for energy, localized wave packets remain localized and move along classical trajectories. As we already know, no faster than light movement is allowed in this case. But what if we do not apply the linear approximation? Then we can expect that the exact probability density will be as follows. The center of the wave packet will still move with velocity v0 but the shape of the packet will gradually transform. Uh, the wave packet will spread out. The spreading out effect was investigated in this paper. Here is what we did. The initial state was prepared as a rectangular wave packet resting at the origin of the position space. The time evolution of this wave packet was obtained by numerical calculation of the integral that was shown earlier. Here is an example of the wave packet at some later time. As you see, the wave function has spread out rather rapidly. Remarkably, the red portions of the wave function which is about 3% of the total probability density, have traveled even faster than the speed of light. According to special relativity, this is not allowed to happen. Let me show what's going on in the Minkowski space-time. At time t equal to zero, the initial rectangular wave packet is placed at the origin. This is the starting point S. Obviously, the probability of finding the particle at the finish point F is exactly zero. At a later time T, the wave packet spreads out, so the probability of finding the particle at the finish line is slightly greater than zero. This is a weak but very clear superluminal signal. 
This means that Einstein's speed limit is broken. This paradox has been discussed in many articles, and the consensus is that there is only one way to fix this problem. Accept that there can be no localizable particles in nature. Hegerfeld wrote, it is impossible to prepare a one particle state which is strictly localized in a given finite space region V. According to Halverson and Clifton, strictly speaking, our talk about localizable particles is a fiction. And Hobson concluded, there can be no particles in any theory obeying both special relativity and quantum physics. The common conclusion is that we can forget about particles. Physics is about quantum fields. But I would like to offer a different solution of this paradox. Recall that in order to prove the absurdity of superluminal signals in special relativity, we had to take the point of view of a moving observer. Now, how does the moving observer see the spreading of the wave packet? To answer this question, we have to transform the initial wave packet to the moving frame. This has been done numerically. If the initial wave packet was rectangular, then for the moving observer, the probability density acquires a complicated form whose tails extend to infinite values of R. Note that this transformation is different from Lorentz formulas of special relativity whose application is shown by the dotted line. We may call this effect the relativity of localization. If a particle is localized for one observer, then other observers may disagree. Let's see how this fact affects the causality argument. On the left-hand side, I showed how the situation is perceived by the observer at rest. As we already agreed, there is a clear superluminal signal. But we also know that the moving observer sees the wave function extending through entire space, including the distant point F. This means that the probability of finding the particle at the finish point is always greater than zero. In other words, there is no well-defined signal coming from S to F. This observation suggests another resolution of the causality paradox. In the moving frame, the probability density is not zero everywhere and at all times. So there is no clear signal. Thus, the moving observer cannot claim a violation of causality. And there is no paradox. Let me now summarize what we have learned in this lecture. First, I wanted to make clear that Wigner's theory provides a full description of the physics of one particle. This description is both quantum and relativistic. We realize that particle localization is a relative, observer-dependent phenomenon. But if this is so, then the idea of sending signals by superluminal tails of wave packets is rather controversial. Not all observers would agree that a signal was really sent. So, no obvious violation of causality can be detected. One thing should be clear, though. No meaningful signal can be sent back in time. Thank you.